Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about Euripides' play, The Suppliant Women, or The Suppliants. Um, this is not really connected to Aeschylus' uh, play, The Suppliant Women, even though they share the same title, subject matter, very different. Um, this play, Euripides' Suppliant Women, is part of the broadly conceived Oedipus cycle, or the Theban cycle, as it's sometimes called. Um, and this would fit, if you're trying to put together a mythological timeline, this would fit somewhere between the events of Aeschylus' Seven Against Thebes and Sophocles' Antigone. Um, we, we are post-Seven Against Thebes conflict, um, in which the uh, uh, Polynices and the champions of Argos try and conquer Thebes in order to restore Polynices' right as king, and they are defeated. So that those events have already happened, uh, but we're not yet at the point of Antigone, where uh, Creon is sort of doomed by his own hubris. Um, but we're in that vein because... The play starts with Aethera, who is the mother of Theseus, king of um, Athens. And basically, she is at uh, the temple of Demeter. And, and she has been surrounded by these supplicating women uh, who want her to beseech her son Theseus to help them. And this is part of what she says in the opening. These women here, leaving their homes in Argos, come to kneel with suppliant branches and entreat my help in their calamity. They are childless. Round the gates of Cadmus's walls, that's Thebes, uh, their seven noble sons lie dead. Adrastus led them against Thebes, resolved to gain for his exiled son-in-law Polynices the due share of Oedipus's inheritance. And when these mothers desired to bury those who had fallen by the sword, the victors, dishonoring the gods' law, turned them back and would not let them take up the dead bodies. Here, sharing the stress of their appeal to me, his eyes flooded with tears addressed as lies, and mourns aloud with his conquered sword the ill-fated force he led to Thebes. He urges me to entreat my son to undertake, whether by negotiation or by force of arms, the rescue of these bodies, and to bear his part in burying them. Upon my son alone he lays this task, and on the city of Athens. So, Aethera basically sets the stage here. This is a similar conflict to what we get in um, Sophocles' Antigone. The conflict re revolves around the unburied dead. Um, in ancient Greek culture, this was a big taboo um, in order to get to the underworld in order to sort of properly in order to, to properly sort of rest after death one had to have the proper funeral rites done and as m more people are, are familiar with Antigone than with uh, Euripides' the suppliant women but the same basic issue applies here in Antigone Creon, king of Thebes, after the death of Eteocles, um, refuses to allow Antigone or anyone else to bury the body of Polynices. In the suppliant women, Creon, again king of Thebes, refuses to allow the mothers of the Argive champions, the people who fought at the seven gates of Thebes in personal combat with Thebes' seven champions, Creon refuses to allow their bodies to be taken back to Argos and buried. This is a big, big problem uh, in Greek religion, and much of the play revolves around these debates about whether or not this is Theseus and Athens' problem, what uh, the Thebans should do, how they could best persuade the Thebans to give the bodies back, etc., etc. That's a lot of what it is. I don't think it's an incredibly interesting play, if I'm honest. Um, I, I, I find it rather boring. Um, there's some interesting bits, but 
overall, eh, I'm not that keen on it. One of the things we do get later in the play when Theseus has actually recovered the bodies, um, we get this sort of repetition of the, the kind of move that um, Aeschylus makes in the Seven Against Thebes, where we get a sort of extensive cataloging of who these champions are, what's distinct about them, why they're important, that sort of stuff. And dramatically, it just, there isn't much going on there. I don't find it a particularly engaging read, and I don't think it would be especially engaging on stage. But there's a couple of interesting things I do want to talk about with this play. One is that this is another instance in which we get this pro-Athenian, pro-democratic context presented. Um, and there's a couple of ways that we have this. Um, probably the most direct is that Theseus has a somewhat extended debate with the Theban Herald about democracy. Um, so the Theban Herald shows up shortly after Theseus has decided he is going to go and request that the bodies be returned, and if the Thebans don't comply, then Athens will go to war with them. The Theban Herald shows up, um, and, and basically the Theban Herald starts out by saying, where is the all-powerful ruler of this city-state? Oh, he says, uh, he says here, who is king absolute here? And Theseus basically says, hey, bro, there is no absolute ruler here. I'm the king, but I rule democratically. Um, at which point the herald is like, there you can see the point which gives me half the game. The city that I come from lives under command of one man, not a rabble. None there has the power by loudmouthed mouthed talk to twist the city this way and that for private profit. Today popular, loved by all, tomorrow blaming the innocent for the harm he's done, getting away with every crime till finally the law courts let him off scot-free. The common man. Incapable of plain reasoning, how can he guide a city in sound policy? Experience gives more useful knowledge than impatience. Your poor rustic, even though he be no fool, how can he turn his mind from plows to politics? The worst pestilence of our time, as every sane man knows, is the unscrupulous upstart whose glib tongue brings him fame and popular power. Now, what I find really interesting about that is that this these are very standard critiques of democracy. Um, there's a, a dude called, by classicists, the old oligarch, who wrote a lot of criticism of Athenian democracy, and he makes a lot of these same points. In Plato's Republic, we get some of these same points. Plato was very much anti-democracy. Um, this idea that like, oh, in a democracy where rhetoric is really important for persuading the body of citizens what to do, they can be easily manipulated and led astray, etc., etc. These are very, very common critiques. And Theseus makes a fairly extended argument um, criticizing, uh, more maybe criticizing absolute monarchy than necessarily defending democracy, but he does both. Um, and some of the points he makes, for instance, are that um, when you have an absolute ruler, because no one can challenge, no one can question, no one can uh, raise concerns without fear for their life, fear for their property, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, the, the city-state loses the benefit of good counsel. So these kinds of arguments. Um, so we've got that sort of positive presentation of democracy, because the Thebans are clearly the villains of this play, whereas the Athenians, for an audience of Athenians at the city Dionysia, where Euripides would have premiered this, um, the Athenians are, are the heroes of this play. But there's one striking thing I noticed about the democratic elements in this play. Um, the democracy 
of Theseus seems to work according to Theseus's will. So this is actually a point that other people have made. I've seen that I've seen this point made by classicists about um, Aeschylus's suppliant women, in which Pelasgos goes to the people of of Argos and says, "You have to make this decision, but here's what I want done," and they do what he wants. Um, here we have a similar kind of situation. Theseus says, um, explaining to, to the chorus of suppliants, with warm goodwill, the Athenian people, when they saw that I desired it, undertook this enterprise. And he had earlier said he was going to convince them to, to do what he wanted. So this is an interesting conception of democracy in which the king has more or less the authority to assert his will and have that be formally approved by the citizenry. So that's an interesting contradiction or paradox of the democracy in these plays. Um, another element here that's really, really interesting is the role of women. And this is interesting in the context of the democracy because, um, as the classicist Edith Hall has argued, the scope of Athenian equality, of Athenian freedom, of Athenian political life on the stage vastly exceeded its scope in reality. So, Ethera tells her son Theseus, um, well, so, so she says, may I speak what concerns your honor and the cities? Theseus says, you may. Wisdom is often heard on women's lips. But then a little bit later, Ethera says, even good advice from women, they say, is worthless. So that's, that's a unique thing. That's a kind of a striking thing that... On the one hand, we have Theseus, the male ruler of Thebes, or sorry, the male ruler of Athens, who's saying, yes, women often have great insights. I want to hear your political perspective on this decision that faces Athens. And then on the other hand, we have Aethera, who's playing that sort of anti-feminist devil's advocate and saying, oh, People often say women's advice is dumb, but then, of course, she shifts and she says, even though people say women's advice is dumb, um, even good advice from women they say is worthless, I'll defy this jibe and forbid fear to make my wisdom impotent. So, again, there's this, this interesting imaginative scope of the Athenian stage in which women, foreigners, slaves, these people who are otherwise excluded from political life in Athens get to speak and get to express wisdom is a really interesting, it's a really interesting component of drama because it reflects a much more egalitarian worldview than what you actually get in practice in ancient Athens in the 5th century BCE.